Thank you all for being here today. I'm going to hand you over to Kate and perhaps the panel members like, might like to come up to the front. Well, thank you very much, um, Deb, for that introduction and for the opportunity of being here with you today. Um, a great thrill to be able to, um, to get in a plane and to, to meet with you in person and to be part of, um, or to be chairing a panel of such um, eminence is also um, a, a wonderful thrill for me. Uh, uh, Liz Sullivan is, is known to me extensively in my, my midwifery work, so um, it's, it's, I'll look forward to, to meeting you in person, Liz. Um, so just correct something that Frances said. Well, it was a shock for me to hear that she had the best job in the world because uh, <laughs> I thought it was me. Um, but um, so it's, 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 it's always about learning, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm coming to you from the other regional uh, centre, um, NHNMRC uh, Centre, which is TARC, the Tropical Australian Academic <laughs> Health Centre, and uh, representing to you really on, um, or presenting to you really on um, behalf of the subcommittee of Wharton, which um, Deb alluded to before. If I said to you, um, Wadamuli, I would be greeting you in the land of the Wagrugba and Bindal people, who are the um, custodians of the land of um, Townsville. And I just join in the um, acknowledgement of country that was given previously and, and pay my... Um, pay my recognition to the work of the elders past, present and um, emerging in their continued connection to land waters and culture. Um, I suppose also when we're meeting about women's health, we, we really do cast our mind back to that uh, wonderful care um, of communities and of land and of, um, of women that um, our, the female elders have given and um, and that holistic way in which they, they see life, which is um, to be admired. So, Wharton, um, as Deb has alluded to, is, is, uh, sits very well under ARA and seeks to empower and improve equity, health and equality of life for all Australian women, integrating prevention, healthcare, research and translation for community benefit. Women remain underrepresented in research, particularly in senior positions, and addressing this inequity is a priority for um, Wharton. The objectives of, of Wharton, um, building capacity and credibility um, across all priority areas of um, women's health, uh, developing women's careers, and I suppose that's been a particular focus uh, for the Workforce Committee. Um, we're looking at sustainable um, and implementing sustainable programs that have scale and impact and supporting and engaging st um, stakeholders from the community. And Leslie's going to um, talk of that more after morning tea. Um, certainly looking at high quality applied translational research as, other, as Deb has uh, spoken of and um, developing the work of uh, or the profiles of clinicians and um, other female health researchers. Uh, looking here, as you would expect from a um, MRFF funded project, uh, $5 billion over five years, we're sort of halfway through, you'd expect that it would have good governance and, and so it does have. Um, we have the ARA Council here, the steering group, which, um, which the work steering group, which Deb has um, recently chaired. And then we have the different groups of community and um, consumer involvement, headed by Leslie, the Indigenous Subcommittee and the Research Subcommittee, which are all doing fabulous work. And I'm just going to present to you now just a little bit of work that we've been doing um, as part of this uh, workforce development. <clears throat> Our focus is really exclusively on early to mid career researchers and as you would hope with women's help we've taken a well in any any sort of feminist inspired research we're taking quite an inclusive approach rather than exclusive approach with um, who we consider uh, early to mid career researchers to be and so um, we go really 15 years out um, from a PhD and also consider other applicants on a case by case basis we're really focused on underrepresented groups and um, and really on that advancing and supporting women in research. So we've done, um, we've, we've been really active as a, as a subcommittee and one of the early things we did in 
ooh, last year, um, and repeated this year, is is a cross-sectional survey of early to mid-career researchers uh, through all those 10 centres uh, that Nikki spoke of before. Um, and in this survey, um, just presenting to you the 2022, so February's um, results here, just looking at um, the demographic there, you can see, it's always, I find it always quite worrying when I identify with the last box, which is really, which is really there's nowhere else to go, is there? <laughs> but um, the most, um, the most common age group was that uh, that 34 to 40 year age group with um, almost a third of our applicants there but either side of that the 26 to 20 to 33 and the uh, 41 to 45 sort of um, occupying pretty much half the the group we asked people about care um, giving responsibilities knowing that this to be a significant um, impediment to the career progression of many and so we've got um, about 57% there um, acknowledging that they had a primary care giving role. So children um, going to school, uh, children with a disability or family members, oftentimes parents. So looking then, um, about sort of two thirds were non-clinical researchers. So um, in either, in either, just let me go back to my notes here. Um, so with non-clinical researchers, and 25% um, were, were clinical. The majority of respondents were working in universities, public hospitals, medical research, or medical research institutes. And you can see um, there 25% in, in public health. Looking at the um, levels of satisfaction, the bars that are blue are respondents are talking that they were um, satisfied, the, that horrible maroon colour is um, not satisfied and the neutral is the grey. And you can see balancing life and career, uh, 40, foot, almost half were, were satisfied, so that's a, a move forward, um, which is pleasing to see. But it, it also means that um, over a third were not. Having, a new, having career opportunities, um, mostly were not satisfied. Uh, career progression, fairly even between satisfied and not satisfied, and having um, job security was was probably the the biggest issue of being not satisfied with um, with half the the group identifying us. So I just have to explain this one a little bit to you. So these were the 15 areas that when people were asked about their career development supports, what they valued. So in rank order there. And then highlighted in the red, they were also asked, did they receive the support? And highlighted in the red is things that are important, but where help was, uh, where support was not, they perceived was not provided. So in name, they are networking, mentoring, fellowships and scholarships, executive and or collegial support and sponsorship, guidance on how to undertake effective research translation aligned with clinical practice, travel support and prize opportunities. So this uh, has really influenced um, the work that we have done to date. Um, I suppose looking at um, the, the, looking at grant writing, we're really focused on the how, um, how people become independent researchers, formulating the grant plan, so that program of research, um, and realistically navigating to a successful career. Um, and looking at the, and also looking at those barriers that are named there. So our activities, we've got emerging leadership fellowships um, uh, in train, they, they will finish up with us uh, at the end of the year and we'll be recruiting towards the end of the year for the next lot of fellowships. We've got the workforce hub and the education and training platform um, that uh, is, is clearly needed for and we'll address some of these issues. We've got the funded awards for the early and mid-career researchers. We've had um, $15,000 grants, about 36 of them, and we'll be up, um, advertising them through um, your uh, centre. So we'll hope to get um, a lot of you on board with um, applications and establishment grants, which have helped the different centres in specific uh, women's health research and the um, communication and stakeholder engagement, which is um, an ongoing thing. So that's, um, that's a little bit of us. And now, I might pose a question to the panel. <laughs> At the ready, here they are. Could I ask you all to reflect back to your early and mid-career researcher days and to identify 
people or events or undertakings that stepped you along in your career. You've all had very different um, journeys to where you are and it would just be really lovely, I think, to hear from you about what assisted you. It would be awkward well, if I had to do interpretive I, dance. I hope they're not. <laughs> a, I don't know, would it? <laughs> so I'll start as the uh, hope that most the oldest here. Uh, <laughs> so um, I have a medical background, and uh, I did an MPH about t uh, after I'd finished my residency, and then I went off to uh, CDC and did a preventive medicine residency there. So I was an EIS officer. So I had never really intended to have a research career, to tell you the truth. Never really thought about it, never really engaged in it and really realised, you know, PhDs and all that sorts of things. And when I came back uh, to Australia, uh, and at that stage I had three children, oh, I think under eight, or maybe, yeah, eight by then, um, I took a job at a university and uh, managed to swing a senior lectureship without a PhD or anything, I think I... So it was sort of in those days, it was just before they introduced the rule at UNSW, uh, but I had an MPH. So I hadn't, didn't really know much about research, and then all of a sudden I was in, um, I suppose, a unit, the National Perinatal Statistics Unit, the Paul Lancaster led, uh, where had had done some research, but it was doing a lot of government work and so I had no, and this was quite isolated, it was based in a hospital, even though it was a university unit. And so it's sort of interesting, I had no sort of guidance or track record, but, uh, and so hence I was a senior lecturer for 10 years. Never bothered to um, apply, because I didn't have a PhD, but also because um, I was so busy with three young children and, um, a lot of program work which was had deadlines, government deadlines, so a bit like the work that uh, the centre does. I won't take the whole of the morning to talk about it, but so a very different, what I'm trying to say is a very different trajectory. And it wasn't until I did, I saw something on the university in 2006, God, showing how old I am, which was a women's leadership program that was for level C's and D's. And um, because I didn't cost the university any money when I requested things, because I it was all externally funded, uh, I got a yes I could attend. So that's what changed my trajectory. Oh, issued, um, because I'd never ever had a performance review in 10 years, never any discussion. So I'm hoping none of this happens to you guys. Uh, so anyway, I did the Women in Leadership course and then I said, oh, well, I'm going to be, I'm leaving if I'm not an associate professor by the end of the year. And so um, that then, I won't tell you how I became an associate professor, but I still didn't have a PhD. Uh, and I was enrolled in one though. And uh, then I, that really changed my life in terms of I thought, what the hell? Uh, because I had been clever enough to negotiate that my salary increased because I was running, was director of a centre. Uh, so I suppose my, my, what changed my life was actually getting onto a course that had 20 other women. It was the first year they'd run it. Uh, these, the people on it, the three or four women who were from medicine on it, uh, we'd all come from very different paths. It was fantastic. I, it was first time I knew what actually a university really did. And um, so I think it's really important. It wasn't an individual. It was a collective of women and being empowered by information. And so I look at that, all the no's, it's all about being in the know and informal and formal networks, um, all the sorts of things, understanding how you do things. And so that's what changed mine. So I think programs that are targeted to women, even though there is a bit of an anti thing about it, are absolutely crucial because we do not have the same trajectory of of networks, we take our caring responsibilities very, uh, very much to heart. And um, so I'm a strong proponent of supporting women. And it's not about getting more, it's about equity. So that's my, sorry, a bit intense. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Nikki. Oh, oh sorry, beg my pardon. No. Oh. You're already. I thought you were good because I'm the youngest on the panel, which I'm not. I'm, I'm not talking <laughs> to you because you've got the best job in the world. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> sure. Uh, thank you. So um, I don't know if I'm going to be less intense or not. <laughs> We're going to escalate as we go up. Um, the, the, the key things that have happened to me in my career have really been when people themselves or have encouraged me to call bullshit on a whole heap of assumptions that, um, or advice that, that I've had. And so I have to, I guess, thank my folks for really exposing me to a world and encouraging me to um, interact with, inquisit with inquisitiveness to the world and not necessarily accepting that the way that things have always been done are the way that things are or need to be done. So I know that sounds a bit wanky, but I, I, as I get older, and I'm getting older, um, I really think that I've been very, I have been very privileged um, to have that start to life. And mum and dad came over to the university here in Newcastle in the 70s and dad was doing a PhD at the time um, and his PhD supervisor moved over and so they helped set up biology here at, on Callaghan and my sister and I were born in the late 70s. Well, I was kind of early 70s but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and we grew up running around the grounds of the university at Callaghan um, and watched it grow and, and expand, um, chase mosquitoes and other sorts of things around over the years. And so for me, it was always just a given that that's where I would go after school. And so again, just being in an environment where those things are, are expected or a, a part of what, what would be normal um, was very important to me. Um, and then in year 10, I had to go and spend some time with our school, I went to Cardiff High School, um, our careers advisor, who was a bloke, quite a traditional bloke, and he uh, asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, I want to do medicine, I want to go to university, I want to study medicine, um, and I want to, because I want to help people, I want to make a difference um, in the world. And he said to me, oh, Francis, I think, you know... Girls are probably better suited to TAFE. Um, have you thought about doing a, a technical certificate at TAFE? And I went, oh, because I actually had never considered going to TAFE. I don't bag TAFE at all, but I thought that hadn't even been a possibility. I went, oh, I'd never really considered that. I might go and have a look at what's there. And I went to lunch and then um, came back and my first subject after lunch was chemistry. And I had a female chemistry teacher who's uh, still teaching today. See, I'm not that old at, at <laughs> Um And Ms. Woodbury, and, and she was, uh, and she said to me, "What is this that I've heard about you going to TAFE?" And I went, "What the heck?" Um, and she said, "Mr. Cooper says that you're going going to TAFE." <laughs> um, when you can go to university and you can do anything you want, so don't listen to his bullshit. Um, and, and he said, and I'm really cross with him for doing that, and I've told him so, and you should make sure that you follow the path that, that you think's right for you and don't limit yourself. And I went, oh, okay. Um, and so again, a, a woman who was a you know, female science teacher in the, um, uh, the uh, eight, late 80s, early 90s, and, um, and copying this sort of thing for herself and then advocating for me um, to call bullshit on some of the, the things that have been said. And then, so I went to uni and, um, and didn't get into medicine, but was really, I then went and did a science degree and fell into psychology, which I absolutely loved because it taught me a new way of thinking about the world um, and a new way of appreciating humans and working with humans. Um, and I always thought I would do clinical psychology because that's why you do psychology, even though my dad would call it pseudoscience. I think, hmm, we can have another question about that, Dad. And then um, I think because Dad had done a PhD, I was always interested in, um, in doing research. And I didn't really realise that, that well, that's what I was doing. And because I was always interested in understanding why. And so I'd always ask why. Well, I'm annoying. I was, it must have been an annoying child. And I think I've passed that on to my kids because they're beautiful but quite annoying. So why? Why is that? And, and not really accepting, again, that idea that because things have always been done that way, that that's the, the best way to do them or the most effective way of doing them. Um, and so I then... Um, I, so I thought I want to do clinical psychology. I went to apply. I went and applied for the master's and didn't get in. And devastated because this is my path, and thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll do a PhD. And so I met Amanda Baker, who was at the uni at the time, and she just had her first um, academic appointment herself, just had a baby, and, uh, and I caught her on a day when she was just inside her office having a bit of a weep because she'd had a really stressful night with, uh, <laughs> with her bub, and then she had this really high-powered meeting, and I turned up going, can I do a PhD with you? And she just went... <sighs> 
And so I think that was a really powerful thing for me because it, it showed how important it was to integrate life into work. Work is part of my life and life is part of my work. So I, I try not to do a balance. I just try to understand and juggle and things will be more important and less important at different times and and what that showed me is that that although you have this hard face this professional face and this can-do face that it doesn't mean that you're not vulnerable you don't experience the things that we all experience irrespective of whether we're inside or outside research and we all lose our shit sometimes and it's actually important that we do that and share and support each other to do that so that was really great and then we went and I did a PhD with Amanda and then um, felt pregnant myself and received some career advice um, from one of the very senior um, clinical academics in psychiatry at the time, who also happened to be a family friend, sat me down and said, Francis, you need to decide whether you're going to be a mum or a successful researcher. And I went, that's bullshit. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, and so again, that that uh, so come up, up against these attitudes and then these potential barriers. And I go, well, why is that? Why do I have to do that? I don't know. Just because maybe you haven't seen it done before, or you're not looking behind the curtain and seeing the stuff that goes on behind the closed doors when we're all there supporting each other, doesn't mean that we can't do both. It's friggin' hard, as we all know, but we can do both. And then when I had our first baby, I um, took six months maternity leave and then came back to, um, I was at the University of New South Wales at the time at NDARC, and did, um, there was a massive national forum that um, Professor Marie Thiessen, who was my mentor and, and supervisor at the time, um, was leading around comorbidity. So that's mental health and drug and alcohol use. That, and that's where my research and clinical work is. And, um, and there isn't, then there wasn't a real coherent um, community of practice around evidence building and, um, and interventions for people with comorbidity. And so we were writing the first ever national guidelines on how comorbidity should be conceived of as treatments, like massive, massive funding. And Marie was there, and, um, and this was my first thing that I was coming to a forum, my first day back at maternity leave. So mum and dad came with me. You can't do this alone. It's about your yeah, support networks. We got in the car and drove down to, uh, to Sydney, um, had mags with us, and they were sitting out on the grass at NDART playing with Maggie and I would go in to bit of the forum, I was planning to go in, come out, breastfeed, go in and out and those sorts of things as we all do. And, um, and all the big wigs were there. There were ministers of health um, there, there were local MPs, all the leading researchers and clinicians in Australia were there. And it was Marie's kind of big, um, big statement to the field and, and putting her mark on the field. And she stood up the front and she said, this is such an honour to be leading everyone here today. Um, this is valuable work, it's important work, it's critical work. I've been working my whole career to do that, um, to come to this point. And so I'm very excited to be here. But I've just had a call from my daughter's school. She's sick and she needs me. So I'm going to go and be with my daughter because I know I've got a great team of people here around me and I know you're all going to work here together and produce the outcomes we need. So have a great day and I'll look forward to seeing the outcomes. Um, and that to me was a critical also part in me being not just a researcher but a female researcher with a family, seeing that you can do both, walk that line and, and be there for your family when you need to be and it not having necessarily to have an impact, a negative impact on your career because Marie is, is one of the most successful researchers um, in, uh, in, health, in health and medicine in this country and remains that way. And so, in, upon reflection, I try to be that kind of a, a leader and person for others because I think it's only when we work together and support each other and talk about the yucky, ugly bits as well as the, the pretty, shiny bits that we can empower us all to achieve the dreams that we want to achieve in our career, whether that be in research, whether it be in the support of research, whether it be in, in connecting with, with community and, and making a difference out there on the ground. So... F fabulous. Um, thank you. There's lots of lessons there. Mr Cooper is waiting for you outside. <laughs> oh, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot that, that goes on. Like, we're, we're all people. We've all got a lot going on. And I think um, 
I wish I'd had a mentor, a, a role model. I, I didn't have a senior researcher who was a woman who was doing that balance or that juggle between family and um, academic career. Um, I got pregnant when I was 17, so my path was a little bit different to start off. Um, I did psychology as well, loved it, loved how the brain worked, never thought about clinical psychology because that was dealing with people with problems. I wanted to just understand the biology and the mechanisms and that, that really fascinated me. Um, so I th always thought I'd be a researcher. I, I'd found it and, I'd, um, and I was lucky in a way to have my kids so young because I was doing my undergrad while I so I could do that part-time and be at home for the kids. And that was a really nice juggle. It certainly wasn't easy, but it was a nice way to do it, which I didn't appreciate at the time. Um, my mum was a huge supporter. She helped me out with my kids. I could not have done undergrad without her. Um, but then, you know, it was, it was really nice to have that clear idea that I was going to be a researcher, that this was my thing and this was my career now. Um, which was great until I realised that I didn't want to do that and I didn't know how to step off. Um, but through the first 15 years, I had supporters, and by supporters I mean academics that threw me in the deep end <laughs> um, and always said this would be a great opportunity and put me on committees and put me on um, you know, society boards and it created opportunities and I don't know if it was because they were trying to get out of something or if they really believed in me, but either way, I jumped at the chance. It was scary. You have to back yourself and I think that's what we don't do very well as women. Um, I certainly, you know, you kind of do things despite everything rather than because you're supported and so that was a huge thing. I guess I've always been, I'll show you, I'll do this as well. Um, and so you kind of just pushed on. Um, so that, that was sort of my research career I was going through and just being exposed to different networks and people in senior roles who I kind of looked at and went, I, I guess I can do that. that. That looks like something I can do as well. And just as good as you. Um, which, you know, it's sort of self-affirming, but you always have that seed of doubt. You know, we all have the imposter syndrome and we shouldn't be here. Um, but you have to surround yourself with friends, with peers, and not just in academia, I would, or, you know, you have to have friends in the normal world <laughs> um, who can actually give you perspective. And, you know, and I think that's a great thing from having a family as well, because when you do get that call, you leave. They're your priority. Um, and, and you just work it out, right? You, you, you just do what you have to do and you muddle along and somehow we all get through. Um, when I decided that I didn't want to be an academic, the biggest step there was my friends and support crew outside of academia. No one in academia knows what it's like not to be an academic, so they're not a very good source of information <laughs> um, and certainly can't tell you about the other possibilities, whereas people outside can and they can support you. And so I really leaned heavily on those people um, as I left academia to show me what other opportunities were there. And there was a lot as researchers, as you know, clinicians, you have so many skills that are transferable. You don't understand what they are until you leave, um, mainly because when we write up our CVs, we always have to list our outputs, you know, and so you're writing, you know, I've got so many publications and I've got these grants and I worked with the community on this endeavour, but it's, it's all the skills that underlie that that are really important, and it wasn't until some Someone took my CV, you know, highlighted all of my publications that I was so proud of, and that we, you know, my blood, sweat, and tears had gone into those, and just wrote excellent communication skills, <laughs> you know, excellent written communication skills, and I was like, oh my God, what's happening here? Um, but you, but you realise that that you know that is important in academia, by you know. We all know that, but it's it's the skills that underlie that, and it's until someone points them out to you that you don't actually realise that that you really it's it's empowering and it means you can do anything and you start to believe in yourself a bit more, and and that was a really nice process to go through as well. So, well, thank you. I mean, what pearls of wisdom and what fantastic different stories. But with um with. And thank you for your generosity in, in sharing that. Now, to the floor, what a wonderful opportunity you have.
to ask away. Deb Loxton, what was your question? <laughs> Big voice. In both inside and outside of the university structure. And uh, like you, Liz, I took part in an ABLE program in the leadership program, and it, it was critical um, for me to, thank you, um, to see how, um, what trajectories um, I could take. Um, what, what are the critical networking opportunities that women need that maybe our centre can provide um, moving forward? Yeah. Go. yeah, I'll start with that one. Look, I, um, I think the most critical thing is that uh, uh, the first lesson, I think, is that you, you do much better with networks and collaborations. Being an individual who thinks they can do everything is, um, it's not a way, you can't be successful in research. I think um, it's really important that we are connected into clinical health services and public health, uh, whichever is your bandwidth, uh, deliverers of services. So I strongly encourage people to have a clinical appointment, if that's their thing, or a public health or a health services relationship where they um, have people who are at the coal face of whatever you're doing. First of all, they're your greatest supporters. Uh, and also it opens up so many avenues of opportunities. And so these can be, you know, a day a week and there's ways to do them and be creative. So I've worked for family planning and NGO uh, as head of research. I've worked for a day a week. I've worked, I work for Justice Health a day a week doing, uh, so even at my level. Uh, so I think that's really important, Deb, to be able to facilitate and broker and introduce people. And you've always got something you can do. And it also lets you understand the culture and what is important within those organisations. So up here, there's so many opportunities, not-for-profits, health sector, public, private, etc. I think the other thing is... Um, leadership um, training and so that's having a business approach what's the value proposition so we get very research grants are very specific government um, tenders are different but it's what is the always what is the value proposition for the people you're working with it be the consumers or patients so I actually think ongoing leadership training or, or whatever you want to call it business development training is really important I think also advice on being selective. Don't make sure you're doing things that are both uh, civically influenced, but that you don't just get delivered the types of roles that don't allow you to progress and add value. I think that's really important to have the strength. And I think overcoming the imposter syndrome. I think we all know what that feels like, and I think women are somewhat socialised into that sort of setting. Uh, and we all know the stuff about people applying for jobs. Men have 10% of the capability and they'll put in an application and think that they're a winner. And women will be ticking off at 90% and wondering whether they're ready. And so you, there's nothing to be lost. You've got to throw your hat in the ring and being bold. And I think the last thing I'll say is providing support that we all have failures, but we fail forward. So I think uh, things may not go the way you want. It's, a, it's an unusual industry research, but I think um, you've got to have some staying power and sort of you've got to have plan Bs. So I think that's really important to support that type of thinking that, you know, it's not personal, you know. I, I think the um, industry <coughs> industry uh, association is, is really important and it it informs your research, but it also makes translation that much easier. Yeah. Do you want to sort it? Okay. Sure. Um, I love those suggestions. I've been um, furiously um, typing down before notes on what we can do and potentially help um, at HMRI. I think some key strategies might be, um, if you're not doing it already, is to ask if you can bring someone along to the key meetings and advisory group sessions that we might be involved in as senior leaders. Um, others do this a lot. Um, and the worst thing that's going to happen is that people will say no. 
Um, and that way you can just get exposed to, as, a, you know, as an emerging or, or upcoming next generation um, leader, exposed to the types of conversations and dynamics that happen behind those um, key committees and closed doors. And so, uh, um, you know, it's a, a, so a bring someone along philosophy um, physically um, is one that I think would work well. I'd really encourage, um, along the lines of, of leadership, is, is to, to think about um, and talk about not just what leadership activities you're doing, but what your leadership style is. And um, and so the, the leadership training and development, I think, is, is about accessing opportunities and the value proposition. But in that value proposition, it's not only what are you going to be there advocating for, but how you what is the strength in your leadership style that can affect the change? And, and to develop a bit of a strategy around that. And I think what we're trying to do at NHMRC we're being recorded, anyway, um, is really encourage um, going forward in those, um, you know, fellowships, the investigator grant statements around leadership is not gear the category descriptors towards ticking off a checklist of all the committees and things that people have been on, but rather create a narrative around what style, uh, what what's your leadership style, what do you bring to the leadership um, table, and how does that play out in the sorts of leadership opportunities and activities that you do. And we're good at this. We are good at thinking about the thinking behind the, the activities that we do. And so for me, my relationship style is about relationship and building and collaboration. And so the activities and the things that I list in my um, you know, leadership section of NHMRC are about how do you how is this building a relationship or, or leading with a collaborative style that's making a difference in mental health or, or whatever it happens to be. And there are ways in which you can work out what that um, style is for you. And I've had some external help and coaching to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. I love those ideas. I just want to add to Francis's where the leaders bring someone along. If you're at ECR, ask to be brought along. Let people know what you want and what your dreams are because if you don't say anything, people think you're happy and people think you're content. So make sure you have those conversations. If you do a performance review, you know, that's an opportunity. If you don't have one of those set up with people that you want to work with or where you want to be, go in and ask them for, for those opportunities. Have meetings, have chats, and just talk to people. I think people, sorry, I, I think people um, are, are very uh, willing to be um, supportive and collaborative, but um, they, if you don't ask, they're not, oh, right. they're not going to offer unless yeah. you ask. And, and if I may add to that, um, one of the, 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 be the better and the greatest conversations that I walk away with is where I haven't had to kind of come up with all the ideas for the person who's before me asking for opportunities. And so if you're going to be proactive, and I really encourage you to do that, have a think about the things that give you energy and the things that drain your energy, and uh, as opposed to what opportunities or committees you want to be on, because that'll be a bit of your first clue as to where you want to be, where you might be most effective, and ask for opportunities that are in line with those things that give you energy. So for me, it's doing this kind of stuff and being around people and not sitting in meetings, but, um, and so that can just help the person that you're going to for advice and opportunity and feedback with a bit more direction about what the sorts of experiences are to try to um, promote you in. Leslie. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you so much for your presentations. This is enlightening, and I'm not even a researcher. Um, Yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like all of you to share. Um, Liz, you actually talked about falling forward. I want you to think of a, a real clunker in your career where you really stuffed up or you said something wrong or what it was where you, you know when, you know that feeling when you're really in trouble and your solar plexus goes nuts because you know your dad's going to be home in five minutes to, to do whatever it is that the, is going to happen in the family? That feeling. And what did you do to actually get through that? And what has it taught you? Like a real, a real clanger. There must be. Is there? Oh, there's, there's always as many. <laughs> yeah. Um... I think I'm someone who's very um, uh, with communication, right? I'm I'm had learnt very early on that you never ever uh, you don't send email. I'm very circumspect with emails, uh, and 
I, um, I'll do one, one, so I was director of AHW um, for many, sorry, AHW, National Perinatal Statistics Unit, I should say, not AHW, um, and I had a very good relationship with the director and, you know, we were sort of an effective collaborating unit, which I ran from the University of New South Wales, and we had, we were, were very organised on a project and we'd done everything and, you know, and this email came out that sort of said, um, oh, you know, you, you haven't, basically, basically said we hadn't delivered something. And instead of picking up the phone call, which would be my normal response, and it had been copied into a whole lot of people, right? I was a bit irritated. Uh, and um, instead of ringing up and saying, look, there's an error here we actually had, or writing the, sort of the normal neutral email, which was, you know, Dear everyone, you know, uh, may, you may have here is the attachment we've provided this. I basically sort of said, you know, out of all the programs we've sort of, we have delivered, you know, it wasn't even a particularly, oh my God, the drama. And I copied everyone in, so don't ever CC, <laughs> uh, as, as, as you know. And I, you were talking about one email. And so I had the director ringing me, oh, you know, Liz, I had to put out all these fires, you know, because you'd done this. this, this, this. But it just, I suppose that's, the, it's this thing about, how um, communication, communication, communication. So I then had to, you know, mea culpa, sorry everyone, you know, <laughs> just, you know, sort of thing, etc. cetera. And, and, and I think it's that sort of, it's being able to, you've just got to be, try and be on point, be careful about communication. And what you might think is a throwaway remark, um, everybody has such a different lived experience and the, it, it's amazing how what you think is neutral or not particularly can, can be done. So that, to me, that was, I suppose, that was failing forward in terms of I hadn't, I'm very circumspect, I just let myself not do, do you know, fly away and you just got to then do it. So that's my little one. So could I just get you to briefly to, um, to give us your response? A, a brief clang. I also sent a terrible email to the <laughs> about a person, um, and I was very. People who know me know how direct I am, uh -huh. and I was a little bit sweary and frustrated, and replied because I was doing it on my phone, and you know how um, Outlook it just you can't always you're not just replying to the one on one. It's often the anyway. Mm. So it went to him, and. Uh, I was totally at a lot. Oh, no, sorry, I wasn't incorrect, but it was totally the wrong thing to do, um, and um, and got it got escalated up to the person's manager, and um, and I just immediately admitted fault, apologised, and said I will do whatever it takes to to correct this. I can't. I'm sure it can't be forgotten, but help me work out what you need for me to um, make you feel a bit better. So I think admitting admitting mistakes and being open and quick to do that rather than defensive really makes a difference um, and don't email debrief. <laughs> Thank you. Just agree with Francis's response, uh, you know, accept responsibility. People, as long as you do it quickly and you apologise, you know, I think it's, you know... When you are at fault, don't unnecessarily <laughs> accept responsibility. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll try. <laughs> yeah, I'll be quick. Um, I immediately all my thoughts went to all the mistakes I've made with my children yeah. uh, but work-wise I guess um, I my PhD experience was not good in terms of supervision I had a very stands-off supervisor when I had my first PhD student I overcompensated uh, and gave her the support that I thought I wanted uh, in doing so I made her a bit dependent on me which was not great and I learned from that and then going through a process of kind of uh, letting her go and, you know, telling her that she could do it herself and she didn't actually need me. So that was, I think your first PhD is always a bit of an experiment. Uh, just be warned, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think our time is, is coming to an end, unfortunately, because I know that we could um, benefit from having um, your insights, uh, sharing your insights, but um, we do need to bring it to wrap. I just reflect on the fact that, you know, if I was to have an email from any of you three, it certainly would be Nikki and it wouldn't yeah. be uh, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> but please join me in thanking Liz, Francis and Nikki.